Hi, Huckle Rumors. It's time for chapter reading. And you know, Mr. Edwards helped Santa Claus bring Christmas presents to Laura and Mary because the creek was rising. Laura and Mary knew that there was no way Santa could cross the creek. And Santa and Mr. Edwards saw each other in independence. And Santa said, can you help so these two little girls, I know they've been good, and they're just waiting for me to deliver their presents. So this is really amazing. Yeah, he did. So when he arrived, Ma told them, close your eyes. And she took all of Santa Claus's presents that Mr. Edwards had brought and put them in their stockings. They had never even thought of having a penny. And think, a whole penny and a cup and a cake and a stick of candy. There had never been such a Christmas. Now, of course, right away, Laura and Mary should have thanked Mr. Edwards for bringing those lovely presents all the way from Independence. But they had forgotten all about Mr. Edwards. They had even forgotten Santa Claus. In a minute, they would have remembered. But before they did, Ma said gently, Aren't you going to thank Mr. Edwards? Oh, thank you, Mr. Edwards, thank you, they said. And they meant it with all their hearts. Pa shook Mr. Edwards' hand, too, and shook it again. Ma and Pa and Mr. Edwards acted as if they were almost crying. Laura didn't know why. So she gazed again at her beautiful presence. She looked up again when Ma gasped, and Mr. Edwards was taking sweet potatoes out of his pockets. He said they had helped to balance the package on his head when he swam across the creek. He thought Pa and Ma might like them with the Christmas turkey. There were nine sweet potatoes. Mr. Edwards had brought them all the way from town, too, Oh, it was just too much, Pa said so. It's too much, Edwards. They never could thank him enough. Mary and Laura were much too excited to eat breakfast. They drank milk from their shining new cups. But they could not swallow the rabbit stew and the cornmeal mush. Don't make them, Charles, Ma said. It will soon be dinner time. For Christmas dinner, there was the tender, juicy, roasted turkey. There were the sweet potatoes baked in the ashes and carefully wiped so you could eat the good skins, too. There was a loaf of salt-rising bread made from the last of the white flour. And after all that, there were stewed, dried blackberries, and little cakes. But these little cakes were made with brown sugar, and they did not have the white sugar sprinkled over their tops. Then Pa and Ma and Mr. Edwards sat by the fire and talked about Christmas times back in Tennessee and up north in the big woods. But Mary and Laura looked at their beautiful cakes and played with their pennies and drank water out of their new cups. And little by little, they licked and sucked their sticks of candy till each stick was sharp pointed on one end. That was a happy Christmas. A scream in the night. Oh my goodness. I don't know what's happening. Can you turn the fire up? Look at that. Can you turn the fire up? Yeah. Oh, that's 
in the middle of the night. Wow. The days were short and gray now. The nights were very dark and cold. Clouds hung low above the little house and spread low and far over the bleak prairie. Rain fell and sometimes snow was driven on the wind. Hard little bits of snow whirled in the air and scurried over the humped backs of miserable grasses. And next day, the snow was gone. Every day, Paul went hunting and trapping. In the cozy fire-lit house, Mary and Laura helped Ma with the work. They had sewed quilt patches, they played patty cake with Carrie, and they played hide the thimble with a piece of string and their fingers they played cat's cradle and they played bean porridge hot facing each other they clapped their hands together and against each other's hands keeping time while they said bean porridge hot bean porridge cold Bean porridge in the pot, nine days old. Some like it hot, some like it cold. Some like it in the pot, nine days old. I like it hot, I like it cold. I like it in the pot, nine days old. I used to sing that when I was a little girl. And the clapping was like this. Bean porridge hot. Bean porridge cold. Sometimes we went, and I'm clapping somebody else's hand in front of me. Bean porridge hot. And then it gets complicated. Bean porridge cold. It's always fun to do. No supper was so good as the thick bean porridge, flavored with a small bit of salt pork that Ma dipped onto the tin plates when Pa had come home cold and tired from his hunting. Laura liked it hot, and she liked it cold, and it was always good as long as it lasted. But it never really lasted nine days. They ate it up before that. All the time, the wind blew, shrieking, howling, wailing, screaming, and mournfully sobbing. They were used to hearing the wind. All day they heard it, and at night in their sleep, they knew it was blowing. But one night, they heard such a terrible scream, they all woke up. Pa jumped out of bed and Ma said, Charles, what was it? It's a woman screaming, Pa said. Oh, he was dressing as fast as he could. Sounded like it came from Scott's. Oh, what can be wrong, Ma exclaimed. Pa was putting on his boots. He put his foot in. He put his fingers through the strap ears at the top of the long boot leg. Then he gave a mighty pull, stamped hard on the floor, and the boot was on. Maybe Scott is sick, he said, pulling on the other boot. You don't suppose, Ma said low. No, no, said Pa. I keep telling you, they won't make any trouble. They're perfectly quiet, peaceable down in the camps among the bluffs. Laura began to climb out of bed, but Ma said, lie down and be still, Laura. So she lay down. Pa put on his warm, bright plaid coat and his fur cap and his muffler. He lighted the candle and the lantern, took his gun, and hurried outdoors. Before he shut the door behind him, Laura saw the night outside. It was black, dark. Not one star was shining. Laura had never seen such solid darkness. 
Ma? She asked. What, Laura? What makes it so dark? It's going to storm, Ma answered. She pulled the latch string in, put a stick of wood on the fire. Then she went back to bed. Go to sleep, Mary and Laura, she said. But Ma did not go to sleep. And neither did Mary and Laura. They lay wide awake and listened. They could not hear anything but the wind. Mary put her head under the quilt and whispered to Laura, I wish Pa'd come back. Laura nodded her head in the pillow, but she couldn't say anything. She seemed to see Pa striding along the top of the bluff on the path that went toward Mr. Scott's house. Tiny bright spots of candlelight darted here and there from the holes cut in the tin lantern. The little flickering lights seemed to be lost in the black dark. I'll show you. So Pa is all dressed and he has the lantern with the candle inside and the lantern has holes poked all along so that the candlelight can shine through. Wow. He sent it over to Mr. Scott's house. After a long time, Laura whispered, It must be almost morning. And Mary nodded. All that time, they'd been lying and listening to the wind, and Pa had not come back. Then high above the shrieking of the wind, they heard again that terrible scream. It seemed quite close to the house. Laura screamed too and leaped out of bed. Mary ducked under the covers. Ma got up and began to dress in a hurry. She put another stick of wood on the fire and told Laura to go back to bed. But Laura begged so hard that Ma said she could stay up. Wrap yourself in the shawl, Ma said. They stood by the fire and listened. They couldn't hear anything but the wind, and they could not do anything. But at least they were not lying down in bed. Suddenly, fists pounded on the door, and Pa shouted, Let me in! Quick, Caroline! Ma opened the door, and Pa slammed it quickly behind him. He was out of breath. He pushed back his cap, and he said, Whew! I'm scared yet. What was it, Charles? Said Ma. A panther, said Pa. He had hurried as fast as he could go to Mr. Scott's. When he got there, the house was dark. Everything was quiet. Pa went all around the house, listening and looking with the lantern. He could not find a sign of anything that was wrong. So he felt like a fool to think that he'd got up and dressed in the middle of the night and walked two miles all because he heard the wind howl. He did not want Mr. and Mrs. Scott to know about it. So he did not wake them up. He came home as fast as he could because the wind was bitter cold and he was hurrying along the path where it went to the edge of the bluff when all of a sudden he heard that scream right under his feet. Oh my goodness. Do you see Pa and the lantern? And look up in the tree? What do you see in the tree? That's the panther. Oh my. But Pa did make it home. He said, I tell you, my hair stood up till it lifted my cap, he told Laura. I lit out for home like a scared rabbit. And we're going to read more about what happened with that scream in the night. Whew. Did you enjoy it? It's a good chapter. Okay, until the next day. Thank you, boys and girls. Bye.